you know anything about the hit indie roguelite Hades, it's probably two things. These gods are hot as hell. Uh, hey there Dionysus. And this game's pacing is incredible. You're pushed from one room to the next, dashing around, putting the hurt on the denizens of the underworld with a wild mix of abilities and items. And after each room full of enemies is taken care of, you're treated with another upgrade and usually a choice of upgrades that you can earn in the next room. But every once in a while, when you finish a room, you'll hear the sound of a fishing spot. Come forth, fishes. It seems like in 2021, every video game asks you to stop your momentum to indulge in a quick fishing diversion, no matter what genre you're playing. Even dating sims like Dream Daddy ask you to do some sort of fishing, which made me wonder, what is the video game industry's obsession with fishing? In theory, fishing is supposed to give the player a calm break from the action of the main game, a chance to take in the environment around them, and maybe even give them extra rewards along the way. But after a while, a lot of these fishing sections start to feel familiar. You find a fishing spot. You cast your rod. You wait. And then you wait some more. Eventually, you get to press a button, and your reward is a salmon, guppy, or a cod. I'm not saying fishing needs to be a breakneck fight to the death against every carp you come across, but something more engaging might be nice every once in a while. Coming soon, Commodore brings you Gorf, the wonder. When fishing was first introduced to gaming, there wasn't a whole lot you could do in terms of programming the activity onto cartridges. But back in 1984, Sea Route to India found a way by having you wait in a little boat until a fish swam right beneath you. After which, you could press an action button to reel in your prey if you timed it right. Not the most satisfying gameplay ever, but hey, the Commodore 64 was revolutionary for the time. The original bait and wait, if you will. Fast forwarding just over a decade and a few technological advancements later, we're greeted with an influx of JRPGs like Breath of Fire 3, whose fishing mechanics were a bit more robust and even gave the player a bit more of an incentive to interact with the system. Here, you found a fishing point and were asked to follow a moving fish icon with a green rectangle for a period of time to ensnare the fish. Hard to master, but easy enough to understand. Fish you caught could be sold for cash or consumed to give your characters benefits in battle like curing poison or regaining a bit of health. Not just an engaging fishing experience, but a genuinely useful reward that helps you in other parts of the game. We love an interconnected web of systems. You go, Breath of Fire 3! Ever since then, fishing has become oddly linked to the JRPG genre, with it being a component in a vast majority of releases over the decades. One of the genre's most celebrated series has also folded fishing into its formula with Final Fantasy's most recent installment taking the concept of JRPG fishing minigames to a whole new level. Square Enix's developers definitely took inspiration from more in-depth fishing simulator games like Fishing Planet and Pro Fishing Simulator. Here, the preparation of your lure, line, and reel is just as vital as your mastery of the gameplay is for a successful catch. When you're ready to cast your line, you'll start moving your rod in the direction the fish is swimming to avoid damaging your line durability and reeling when the fish is less aggressive. Taking the fish's stamina down to zero is a careful balance between aggressive play and patiently waiting to strike. There's a lot to manage here, so you won't be guaranteed a catch until you start really polishing your skills. But that's exactly why so many people found it so engaging. It was almost more in-depth than the main game's fighting mechanics, but that's a different video. 15's fishing was such a popular feature, 
Square Enix even decided to release Monster of the Deep Final Fantasy XV a year later, a spin-off entirely built around the fishing that players fell in love with. Apart from the admittedly flimsy story, the fishing mechanics were on full display here, so Monster of the Deep was received pretty well by most fans of XV's angling system. But for my money, the best modern day adaptation of the fishing minigame comes from outside the JRPG landscape with Concerned Apes Stardew Valley. In this farming sim, you're tasked with taking care of your plot of land, upgrading and organizing to your heart's content, and also maintaining relationships with villagers who fill out your cozy little escapist town. The way you fish in Stardew is actually a callback to the JRPG roots of the rhythmic style of fishing that we saw in titles like Breath of Fire 3, where you need to chase a fish around a meter in order to make it yours. There are added complications every once in a while as well, with treasure chests being thrown in from time to time that ask you to take a huge risk if you want what's inside. Either you get both the chest and the fish before the timer runs out, or you walk away with nothing. But you can also just catch the fish if you're not feeling especially bold. A dynamic split second decision. Love that. So while the rewards for catching these fish are mainly just an amount of cash when sold to Willy, the gameplay is alluring enough on its own that you want to hone your skills regardless. That's the sign of great gameplay if you ask me, especially in an otherwise laid back sea of farming sims. During 2020, the popularity of these quaint sims skyrocketed, serving as an escape from the frightening reality of the pandemic we all faced. So when the new installment of Nintendo's Animal Crossing released, everyone had to get their hands on it. Here, most of the daily tasks can be taken care of within a matter of minutes, so most players had a lot of time to get familiar with catching bugs and angling fish. So while catching bugs asked you to be a careful predator, fishing asked you to basically do what you did all the way back in Sea Route to India stand around and wait to press a reaction button. And when you do get that elusive coelacanth, you can donate it to Blathers. Yay. Because of that level of accessibility though, Animal Crossing New Horizons became Nintendo's highest selling game of the year, encouraging many copycat releases. If there's a market for relaxing games that can be played for bite-sized chunks of time with cute and cuddly animals, it makes sense devs would want to cater to that market. It seems every few weeks though, there's another cottage core release that lets you chop down trees, pick up shells, and fish to your heart's content until you get bored and move on to the next one. Look at Cozy Grove, for example, one of the many recent slice of life sims. Not only is the game targeting the exact same crowd as Animal Crossing, but it even shares mechanics and entire animation sets. When fishing, for example, it's pretty clear that Nintendo's 2020 Goliath of a Quarantine Buster was much more than just an inspiration. This is exactly the same. And so many other games over the past few years have dropped the ball when it comes to making interesting fishing experiences as well. Hades, Near Automata and A Short Hike are all great games in other areas, but their fishing mechanics are basically just Animal Crossing with a different art style. Blood and Even though fishing minigames are meant to be a diversion from the action that sometimes give worthwhile rewards, that can't be the only reason that they're so prominent. A lot of players say that fishing is one of their favorite parts in a lot of games, but you rarely hear the same fanfare for cooking or base building, which also pop up everywhere these days. There's something about fishing, and the prizes games dish out for it that reminds me of something. Oh, that's right, loot boxes. Loot boxes ask us to take an action, most of the time that's spending money, to receive a reward that has a small chance to be what we wanted. It's essentially a form of gambling targeted at gamers, which is why the practice has received heavy criticism in the past. Of course, fishing minigames are not loot boxes. Normally, the only thing that a game will require you to spend in order to fish is a few seconds of your time and maybe some bait from an in-game vendor. But they work on a similar psychological principle to hook us. 
Intermittent reinforcement is a concept in psychology which shows us that when we're rewarded for a behavior every once in a while, and those rewards are satisfying enough, we'll be more likely to engage in that behavior more and more, chasing that chance of a reward. Even if we know the chances for that reward are slim. Our brain will produce dopamine every time our actions result in what we perceive to be a worthwhile prize. With the rush being worth more to us the longer we're made to wait, if that big catch took us hours to achieve, our brain's dopamine production kicks into overdrive. After a while, our brains will get addicted to that hit of dopamine we get, even if that desired outcome is given to us 1% of the time, say, with a legendary fish, or the promise of a really valuable skin when it comes to loot boxes. And that's exactly the reason that loot boxes are such an addictive and manipulative inclusion in a lot of AAA titles. Legislature has been passed in places like Belgium to outlaw games that feature paying loot box systems at all, on the basis of this psychological manipulation in game design. Intermittent reinforcement is so strong, it can make us put up with a lot of tedious tasks or even spend large amounts of money because we are wired to crave that dopamine it gives us. So while bait and wait fishing minigames aren't by any means a diabolical money hungry scheme from developers to drain our wallets, on a neurological level, they work in exactly the same way to make us want more. Throw in some achievements for completionists, and you've got people staying with your game for hours after the credits roll. Hook, line, and sinker. But hey, maybe I'm just being cynical and should sit back and enjoy casting my rod, right? Nah, I'm bored. Hey there! Thank you for watching the video, I had a lot of fun making it, so if you enjoyed it, go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe for more content like this in the future! If there's a fishing minigame that I totally forgot to talk about, let me know in the comments down below, and if you want to come hang out outside of the YouTube space, the links to my Discord and Twitch are down below.